I'm joined by one of the great scorers of all time, Bernard King. Thanks so much for joining me, man. Absolutely. Glad to be here. I was just reading some of your book, and uh, there's so much interesting stuff in there to me. Like, to me, the player and coach dynamic, you talk about Hubie Brown. I don't know Hubie Brown like that. You have a different relation with the coach <laughs> than I do as a viewer on uh, TNT. Like, he, to me, he just seems like a sweet old man. But then I see, when he's talking to you, I was like, Jesus, these are intense moments you have with him. Well, you know, it's my basketball journey. It's not only a basketball journey, it's the journey of my life. And this is the book, folks, right here, <laughs> Game Face. <laughs> you don't waste any time. We were going to get to that. But huh? you, <laughs> hey, we take it from right off the bat. <laughs> so, you know, you're talking about Hubie. Hubie was a great coach to play for. But uh, when, I, when I joined the Knicks, he was a very intense coach throughout all of his career. And he just had a way of speaking to players that I felt was disrespectful. And you wouldn't stand for it? Uh, well, I, I, I respected him. And uh, I didn't think it was necessary to speak to me in that way. I was ready every game. I was highly self-motivated. I wanted to be great. I wanted to perform well here in New York City. And I just had to take him aside and have a frank discussion with him about how he should speak to me properly and respectfully as I would respect him. And we saw eye to eye and we got along quite well after that. It, you know what's really interesting to me is to be a great coach, you, you can't just be a great X's and O's guy. You have to be really great at dealing with players. I mean, it's, it's two totally different things to have like people skills, but also be this great mind. And it's almost like being like a mathematician and then also a therapist at some times. It's two totally different things. So when, when you see like the coaches you played for, did, did you have a special connection with it? Was there anyone in particular that you really connected to as a coach? Uh, I would say number one was Al Adels. Al Adels coached me when I was with the Golden State Warriors. And he was a former player, he won a championship, and he understood what it took to play the game at a very high level. And so he communicated very well with his players, and consequently the players, they were willing to do anything for him. Uh, Hubie Brown uh, was, a, was a great coach. You know, unfortunately, his communication skills were, were lacking, and uh, I, I think that uh, he helped, I helped to develop him in that area. That's interesting. If coaches are open minded, you could learn from the players too, you know? Absolutely. I'm learning from you on how to dress on this show. But hey, listen, uh, I, forgot, I forgot my warm up outfit. I should have worn my Nick warm up outfit today with you. <laughs> I, uh, I love the old, I love the Nick's outfits. You wear the warm up with like the, the old school NY. Like it looks mm -hmm. like the Yankees logo, but it's orange. Yes, well, I love that logo as well. Any Nick logo is a good one for me. But obviously, I grew up watching the old Knicks in terms of Earl Monroe, Walt Frazier, Dave DeBusher, and all of those Willis Reed, those great Knicks. And those are the Knicks that I think of in terms of legacy. I wish I played with Patrick Ewing. And when you talk about the Knicks, that would have been a really fun time. It would have been unstoppable. Well, we would have won a championship, I think. <laughs> that would have changed my childhood so much. In what way? In what way? I would have way? been a happier kid. <laughs> Did you play hoops? Yeah, but like very low level. I mean, I'm a lanky Jew. What do you think I got here? <laughs> so you didn't have any hops, you're saying? <laughs> no. I have, a, I have a nice two-inch vertical. Well, all you had to do was perfect the baseline jump and you would have been okay. Well, you had like a knack for scoring. You're one of those guys that I just watch clips of and the ball just goes in. You have like this turnaround jumper. You had, you had moves. I, I feel like if you're a scorer, there's other aspects of your game you can develop. If you, you just have a nose for scoring or you don't. Well, I, believe it or not, I had a systematic approach. I had a system for scoring, and I had nine spots on the left, nine spots on the right, and four spots from the front of the rim to the top of the key. Now, can you add that up? <laughs> Not that quickly. 22 spots. Gotcha. So I had 22 spots where I wanted to get my shot, and that's really what made me a very effective player. I outline all of that in the book. Maybe that'll help your game with someone else's game. <laughs> I'm taking this book straight to the park. Yeah, you know, you do have a sophisticated approach as a player, because I, I remember seeing, reading that you, uh, you talk about developing your wind, right? Yes. I mean, like certain guys, they just think they have to run, but you would say, no, you have to sprint. So you would sprint. It's kind of symbolic to me that you would sprint across the Brooklyn Bridge, and then you're this New York guy, and then you're the New York captain. Like, did that? It's kind of. Don't you find that to be kind of symbolic? No, it's amazing. It, re it really is to think about it. A little kid from Brooklyn, nicknamed Little Small. Uh, one day I take this basketball and I'm standing there in front of this rim, and I can barely get the ball up to the hoop. And the next thing you know, I'm sprinting across the Brooklyn Bridge, and that was a, a, a reason to develop my game was around conditioning in something that I learned by running across the bridge. And you know what I did? I used to run because it was very challenging running across the Brooklyn Bridge, not quite the New York Marathon, but I would run thumbs up. And yeah. thumbs up means that I'm ready. 
And, and I used to do that on the basketball court as well. And you think about the wooden planks and you think about the beauty of the day, the water and the sun coming down. It was challenging, but it was wonderful. And I took that conditioning all the way to the NBA. Yeah, it's in, I mean, to me, you also said something in the book that was like pretty, it's painful. I mean, the moment where you, where you knew you got injured, you knew you hurt your knee. Yeah. I mean, that's, to me, like I've had bad gigs. I'm a comic. I've had bad gigs. <laughs> I can see them coming a mile away. What is a bad gig for you? Okay, one time I was doing a gig and this guy, we were like talking back and forth and then he just stood up and I heard him go, and I was like, this is not going to end well. <laughs> Spat right here. That's oh, a bad no. gig. But here's oh, the thing. No. I get to go back up the next night. Oh, wow. Right? Like with you, you come down your knee, you're done. Yeah. Right? I mean, you have to just, I mean, it's not just a physical toll but a mental toll that you have to really I mean you see it with someone like Gordon Hayward right now yeah and that injury you know it's like it's not just the physical toll it's like how do you stay mentally tough in that time how do you I mean you were at your peak you were 28 when it happened I'm, I'm 28 um, leading the league in scoring yeah uh, voted most valuable player the preceding year I'm first team all pro so I'm at the pinnacle of my career at 28 years old and can you imagine what it's like when if you're in the air and you know your career is over I can't imagine. Well, that's what happened to me. I'm chasing Reggie Theus on the court, and I planted it more aggressively than I ordinarily would because I was trailing him further away from the basket than I wanted to. And on that plan is when I actually tore my knee. And I go up into the air, and I'm in the air, and, and I'll never forget it. I said, oh, my God, because I knew what happened to me and what transpired that it was probably over. And for 24 hours, you, you, you deal with all the self-pity of that and why me and all the whys, and you cry for 24 hours. Right. And then after that, you have to now get refocused and think about how are you going to handle this because no one has ever come back before. And I just was quite determined, as determined as I was to leave Brooklyn and get out of Brooklyn and go to higher heights. I was just simply determined to uh, return from that. And you did return from that. I, I did. You know what really helped me? As a young kid, and I outlined in the book, uh, I used to read psychology books, you know, and I love psychology. And my mother would catch me in bed at night reading with a flashlight psychology books. And I learned from that. It taught me how to be analytical, how, how to be focused. And I utilized that during that period of two years that I worked five hours a day, six days a week, how to mentally prepare to deal with a situation like that. And it helped me tremendously reading those books as a youth. And I still carry it through life. But I tell you what the last thing I did each and every day after five hours, I took this right hand and I patted myself on the back. <laughs> and I would say, great job today, Bernard. Great job today. And then I forget about it until the next day. That's good. What, this went Tony Robbins pretty quickly. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, no, that's great. I mean, look. <laughs> You hey, played in. I'm sorry. How much is a man worth? <laughs> a lot. Okay. <laughs> Checkmate. <laughs> so you played in this amazing era of I, like I, you know, it's a little before my time, so I have to watch a game on like hardwood classics and yeah. stuff like that. But that era to me is so great. Like the '80s and '90s, there's something so, and I love the game still, obviously. But there's something so gritty about the '80s. I think of like the Bird. You were in a tough conference with Bird and Isaiah. You had, you had Bird, you had, think of my position, Isaiah, of course. But Julius you know, Irving. I'm thinking about the guys I have to defend that's going to embarrass me toughest? every night. <laughs> you know, who's Larry. the toughest to defend? Dr. J, oh, wow, Bird? You had so many guys. You had Larry Bird, you had Dr. J, who was my standard. You had Dominique Wilkins, you had Alex English, and just great. It was Alex Eric. English, one of the great underrated scorers. Yes. I mean, did he not, I think he led the league in scoring for the 80s, right? Oh, well, he did. Unbelievable he did. player. You know, incredible player. He yeah. played in Denver, so you know, a lot of people don't know that much about his career because he didn't get the publicity. But he's one of the all time greats. You know, I'll tell you a funny story. Uh, my, my rookie year, when I began with the New Jersey Nets, second game in, first game scored 13 points. Is, that's an off night for me, by the way. Yeah. 13 points. Okay. I know. I saw you. <laughs> and um, you're nervous. You're beginning your career. And the next night, we're facing. The vaunted Dr. J. 20 years old, and I'm facing Dr. J. Now, between the lines, I don't care who you are. I don't respect you between the lines, but this is Dr. J. So I go out, I drop 42 at 20 years old against the standard, my standard. I get dressed, I feel good, I put on my pinstripe suit, take the shower, <laughs> walk out the locker room, I look down the hall. Wow, she looks good. Gorgeous woman. <laughs> I'm thinking I'm confident, let me go meet her. So I walked down the hall and I said, may I have the pleasure of introducing myself to you. My name is Bernard King. 
You know what she said? Why? What she said? Get out of here, Bernard. I'm Doc's wife. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I said, oh, no, oh, no. And I scurried away before Doc came out. <laughs> but then at the end of the night, you gave yourself one of these. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I didn't pat myself on the back for that one. But you got 42. No. Uh, yeah, for 42. Yeah, <laughs> but not for talking to Doc's wife. <laughs> That's pretty wild. Does he know this story? I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> and if he does, he may know it by now. <laughs> So he was definitely one of the, t I mean, Bird has got to be unbelievably tough. Well, Bird was awfully tough. To, to, you know, I, I indicated in my book uh, that uh, he was the toughest player I ever had to guard and yeah. I had to play against. And the reason for it, he's 6'10". Hit the three-point shot, he can post you up, and he can see over the top of you at 6'10", so he can always pick you apart with the pass. And he was a great rebounder as well in putting the ball on the floor in the open floor. So. He was my um, toughest player I, I had to uh, defend. But I wonder why he didn't defend me. Hmm. <laughs> Just something to think about. <laughs> so, uh, are there guys now, I'm sure you've heard the Carmelo comparisons, the, you know, being a New York Nick. Yeah. Like, are there guys in the league right now who remind you of you in any way? I, I, I would have to say it's Carmelo. Yeah. You know, and the reason why it's comparison, uh, Carmelo shared this with me and he said it publicly. He used to watch my game tapes. Uh, to help to develop his game, and and actually, I would I would see it in his game when he when he played. There was one move in particular that I that I loved. Left hand side of the floor visualization is very big for me. I see it. I'm in the garden right now. Left hand side of the floor. Yeah. Front court, being defended by you. <laughs> is that okay? It's by you. Bad matchup. By you. Yeah, yeah. All right. I raise the ball. Yeah. Like this over my right shoulder. Yeah. You as a defender, you reach, yeah. which I want you to do. And then when you reach, you straighten up. Yeah. And then I take the ball as Mello would. Okay. If you, you saw Mello do this move, you take it, you sweep it down low, yeah. across your legs, and you get that first step to the basket. And that was my best move. And, right. and Mello... Like uh, starts with the face up and then just... You raise it up. Hold on. Do it with me. Come on. You got the ball. Yeah. Raise it up over your right shoulder. Uh, now sweep it down low. No, straight down. Go straight out that way to the basket. Gotcha. You got your man beat. Use that the next time you play. I'll use it on uh, 100th and Broadway where I play <laughs> with uh, a lot of hungry Is that where you people. play? Yes. Is that where you play? I play there on Saturday sometimes, yeah. yeah. Good games? Uh, I don't know by your standards. <laughs> well, no, hold on. this is a different standard today. Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't play. You don't play, but <laughs> no. I mean, th those must have been the best years for you, like the, the Knicks years, right? I would, I, yes, without, without a to doubt. To play, I mean, do people annoy you? They hit you up for tickets all the time, your friends you grew up with? Well, you know, one of the things I had written into my contract <laughs> when I played here, that I would get 15 tickets a game. So I didn't have to worry about being annoyed about tickets because I knew I had them for, for every single game, and I was grateful to, to the club for providing that. But <clears throat> playing here is nothing like it in the world. Yeah. Playing at Madison you Square Garden. and not only feel it because of the fans, but you feel, at least I did as a kid from Brooklyn, you feel the aura. You feel the presence of the legacy of the great Knicks that came before. Yeah. And so every time that I would put on that uniform in the locker room, that's what I represented. I represented the history of the Knicks. I, I represented Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I represented the city. Yeah. I represented the heart of the city. Yeah. And I wanted to represent that every time I, I took the floor. And I, I believe I did that awfully well. But I tell you what I did before each game. I, I had a um, system technique that I would go through, a process, as I would refer to it, before the game. And my teammates, they knew not to speak to me during that time. Now, I've never done this on camera before, but I'm gonna do it for you here today. Please. All right? Yeah. Because there's a switch for me. At least it was when I played. I would close my eyes. Don't worry, it's not gonna be long. <laughs> okay, <laughs> not gonna run out of film. Yeah. <laughs> Are you about to kill me? <laughs> you think you can guard me? No. I don't think so. <laughs> so that was my game face. I like it. <laughs> I like it. Well, I like that you talk about like having this great sense of humility and, and respecting the people that came before you because yeah. I think that's important to make a great player. And I hope that the players who play now have the 
have the same mindset. And it seems like a lot of the great ones do. Like a lot of them, you know, you'll hear someone say, you know, some great shooting guard now say, I watch T-Mac, I watch Kobe, someone. Yeah. So you hope that they watch the people that came before them and they hope they watch you and watch the, it's on YouTube, there's footage. Well, I don't know if it, um, you know, watching me uh, helps, but I remember talking to LeBron James when he was a rookie. Yeah. Uh, when he won rookie of the year, the NBA flew me in and asked me to be part of that uh, celebration with Dr. J. And I went over and I introduced myself to him. He said, I know who you are. And he said, come here, come here. He was calling his cousin. He said, we were just watching you this afternoon, your mid-range game. I said, you know, you play like you've been in the league for 10 years, LeBron. Yeah. Where did that come from? I guess it was amazing, the maturity level. You talk about watching other players. He said, what I did as a young kid growing up, he said, I would watch game film of great NBA players and I would learn by watching Oscar Robinson or watching these other great players and I would incorporate it into, into my game. And it's amazing what he's done throughout his entire career is, is simply incredible. And then he hit on Dr. J's wife. <laughs> oh no, come on, no. Well, it wasn't my wife at least. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for sitting down with us, uh, Bernard. It was Absolutely. great talking to you. Enjoy and the book, to you as well. Game Face, is available. Go out and get it, please. Get You'll it. enjoy it. <laughs> Takes you on a journey. It's rhythmic, it's artistic. You'll love it. <laughs> thank you so much, man. Thank you for having me.